Well, Jim, let's go from the cloud of ecstasy back to reality, I guess, and back to the world of wrestling as we know it. Well, and we want to talk about um, the AEW. We don't really want to talk about it, but we're going to. The AEW television program for March the 6th. But uh, first, I just heard this morning, and I wanted to make mention of it, that uh, Jay Lethal's mother, Shirley Shipman, passed away, apparently, I guess, yesterday as we're recording this. And boy, just her and, and his father both used to come to Jay's matches. They supported him from when he first started training and they were at all of his matches, you know, early on in the Northeast and when he, before he was traveling everywhere and they're real nice people. And they did the angle with, uh, with Jay and Steen in, in very near his hometown. I, I can't remember the little town in New Jersey that we were in, but it was like five or 10 miles from Jay's hometown. And they were in the front row for his title match. And the guys were fighting out on the floor in front of them. And I think it was Jay's dad throws the the drink in Steen's face because he's abusing their son, and Steen thinks it's a fan and turns around and spits at him, and it spits on Jay's mother. And Jay comes up and goes berserk, and they have this big arena brawl, double count out. What we were doing was we didn't know for sure whether we were going to be able to get and everybody seemed to want good old El Generico for a final battle that year. And we were shooting an angle because I would have rather gone with Jay Lethal versus Kevin Steen for the ring of honor championship to begin with. But the, the other guys wanted one more farewell match. Why didn't you know if you would get him? Uh, because this is when he wasn't under contract and he was being fishy because they were promising him that they'd bring him into or it was NXT, or if it was FCW back in those days, or whatever it was. So we we weren't sure, and I was like, we're I don't even want to get off on this, but I was like, we're kowtowing to these guys and this thing for this indie, what you know, dream match when we need to build Jay Lethal as our top star. But nevertheless, um, so that was the, an angle that they worked with us in, and and anyway, they were big fans of Jay's work as I am, and. We're sorry to hear about his mother passing away, and we just wanted to make mention of that before we talk about this television program, which Jay was actually on briefly for a second. Imagine that. It's nice to see, but nevertheless, we go to Atlanta, Georgia for AEW Dynamite. We weren't actually in Atlanta. They're in the Gas South Arena. Apparently now in Atlanta, there's just arenas popping up all over the place. If if you didn't, back in the day, if you didn't go to the Omni, you pretty much were out in the fucking flea market. But it was dark. It assumed, I assumed rather, that it looked so dark because it was mostly empty. I don't know how big it was. But do we have any quotation on how they did in this thing? Because there was some hollow sounding things that went on. Uh, we do have the attendance. I would have to double check somewhere for what was actually the building capacity, but hold on. AEW Dynamite. Um, I, su I surprised you with that. You did. On March 6th, the Gas South Arena, Duluth, Georgia, there were 3,246 tickets distributed uh, the previous time they were there. This according to WrestleTix. August 23rd, 2023 for Dynamite, they drew 5,343. Yeah, so they're down a couple thousand, but that's tickets distributed, not actually, everybody didn't have to show up. That includes all the comps they gave to the furniture store, whatever. But nevertheless, Tony Schiavone's in the ring. We're going to start out with a bang with Swerve Strickland and Prince Nana. And immediately, Tony gives the intro talking about how all the fans love Swerve Strickland, which they do. It's clear they're chanting Swerve's house and cheering for him, but there's... It's like the announcers have suddenly, okay, well, you were a heel doing the most dastardly things, and you've got a manager who also manages other heels, but you've never done anything really to turn. The people just started to cheer for you, so now we're not going to acknowledge all of that. We're just going to say, the fans love you. And, and not as a babyface manager, when you really think about it, with the dancing and everything, how are you going to yes. do that? Well, yeah, well, but when he comes out, well, we'll talk about the other guys in a minute. But uh, 
he uh, Swerve does the promo talking about, well, Joe won at the pay-per-view. Hey, is it karma for all the bad things that I've done? <laughs> is it, I've done some pretty bad things around here. And, hey, it, am I just supposed to be an also ra- He's got the doubt going on. He's doubting himself. It's terrible when people have doubt about them. And, he, and Swerve takes the microphone and leaves Tony standing there just, Tony not only goes and stands in the corner, but he just stares off out of the ring while this shit's going on. I do, if he's going to be in the ring and conduct the interview, have him be in the ring and conduct the interview. If he's not, don't. He just stands there holding his cock. <laughs> so <laughs> Swerve then it says Greensboro was different because the people, they, they flew from Washington. They were rooting for me. They wanted me to win. And because of that, I'm not going to let you down. So now he's just, I'm coming for Samoa Joe. He promised that he would beat Samoa Joe for the title. So apparently, because you know that Tony has read the rule of thumb that baby faces never promise anything they can't deliver on the internet, that means Swerve's winning the title. But now, so he's just full-fledged baby face now. They've gone with that. And in Joe's music plays, and... Joe had a good line. He said, you're making promises you can't keep because your house, unfortunately, exists in my world. And so Swerve's answer to that is, well, we're, we're, we're dressed to wrestle. We don't have to wait. Let's do it tonight. As a matter of fact, let's do it right now. Total baby face. <sighs> See? It's just, uh, yeah. So then, as he says that, the undisputed era of the kingdom of... The Spiders. And what is their name? They used to be the Undisputed Era. Now they're the Undisputed Kingdom. They're Adam the Undisputed Cole, Kingdom now, yeah. Adam Cole and the Job Squad. Uh, my God, where in the world are those shirts? Would you, Tony should buy that trademark. He's built one. He doesn't even realize it. So Adam Cole wheels out in a wheelchair with Roderick Strong and Matt Taven and Mike Bennett and Wardlow. And Taven and Bennett, as we know, are the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. And I'm not sure if they could get any takers for those belts at a pawn shop. And Adam's now, but they, he doesn't have the Adam Cole music. It's it's the fucking whatever heel music they're playing. Nobody is ready for story time with Adam Cole, baby. And he tries to put these guys over, and there might be a chance of him succeeding at that. As we've mentioned, if they not only hadn't been beaten like government mules, but uh, continued to, to be beaten in a fashion that only losers can fulfill. And and he tells Samoa Joe he's champion because they let it happen. Nobody remembers that at this point. Do they? Has that just... It's just lost. And Wardlow's going to win the AEW title very soon. I bet you that ain't going to happen. And then Swerve knocked Cole's guys, and Cole said, well, next week we'll just have Matt Taven and Mike Bennett versus Swerve and Samoa Joe. And Swerve's like, well, why wait? Good boy, he's, he's full of vim and vigor there. And Adam said, no, no, it'll be next week. And as soon as he, as soon as he said that, Tony Schiavone chimed in out of wherever he was, and they didn't even remember to turn his microphone on at first. And he said, no, I just heard from Tony Khan. The match is on right now. I swear, the decision was made by Tony Khan under 10 seconds after the challenge was uttered. It's, I mean, it's almost like it's being sent out by mental telepathy. He's on the goddamn headset agreeing to something that hadn't been pitched yet. And then they just started the match. And so suddenly Swerve is teaming with Samoa Joe. Did we ever hear what Swerve thought about that? Or he just went along with it without saying a word? Boo to a goose, as Adrian Street would say. Well, once Tony Schiavone says something, it's official. Well, because it came from Tony Khan, who's a, a telepath. All righty. So they have the match, and Joe beats the heels up for a while, and then Swerve beat the heels up, and then Swerve... Beat Taven flat in the middle one two three. It was in minutes. So, so these guys are, and the and then the Ring just, of Honor tag champions, right? Yes, they're the greatest Ring of Honor tag team champions of all time. I believe was the phrase. 
And they were beaten by a makeshift tag team that doesn't like each other in minutes with very little offense. And then as Swerve was staring back at the rest of them, like you want some more, Joe walks up behind him and, and grabs sleeper on him, choked him out. <laughs> oh. Oh, what, the, what is there to even say about I mean, the booking is so bad. Ring of Honor. Let's just talk about Ring of Honor real quick, whatever that is. Because they treated their tag champions the way Triple H used to treat everyone in the, you know, the first part of the century. Every tag team, Triple H would beat them. Ring of Honor tag champions beat by this makeshift team of <laughs> two guys who hate each other. In minutes, in minutes, in minutes, it took, it took uh, Will Ostrich. Um, 20 minutes. I'm I'm going to say eight, seven times as long as this match was <laughs> to beat Kyle Felcher. And the other problem is the Undisputed Kingdom. No one cares about him. Well, of course not. Because look, what... <laughs> the feud with MJF had the reverse effect that it should have. It caused people just not to want to see any of these people. And, and again, poor Mike Bennett. What the fuck has happened to his hair? All righty. Um, for later on in the program, the the uh, the douchebag twins were out to let us know that they have two big announcements later on. So we got that going for us. And then they had an FTW title match between Hook and Brian Cage. Hook is he's rangy, as they used to say. He's He's got that slim physique to him, and Brian Cage is a, a walking steroid injection. And they're, it's, a, it's a title that was made specifically to not be sanctioned, to be carried by Taz and ECW with the whole campaign, whatever the fuck. But now they're having sanctioned matches for this title that's not supposed to, the whole idea of fuck the world is it ain't sanctioned. And because it's the FTW title, they're garbage matches with weapons and thumbtacks and chairs and garbage cans and lazy booking for no reason with just two fucking guys that, you know, they just put together. And I think Cage was dressed as, as either a video game character or they just pulled him out of a Halloween party. Um, and... Hook somehow <laughs> beats this guy that's 100 pounds bigger than he is in this garbage match, and then that's when the rest of Prince Nana's heels hit the ring and attack Hook. You remember Prince Nana's other heels, the, you know, the various crew of job guy preliminary heels that he manages when he's not managing the most popular babyface in the company. Now he didn't come out with them. If he, you know, maybe the, over the last week he's seen the light and dropped these guys like a bad habit. But yeah, they come out and they beat up Hook, and then Jericho comes out with a baseball bat, and everybody runs away without him being able to hit him because I don't think they wanted him. He hit one guy, and the guy's like, "Oh shit, let me get out of here." So, what the fuck is going? What what was this? purpose could this serve and with nana they should just do something where he sells his stable to smart mark sterling or something and moves on just him and swerve because that works maybe he could he could trade him for weed the lack of reaction to jericho even when they try to gimmick up the potential for a reaction with the music and everything it's growing he's looking worse out there but the lack of reaction is growing this is what we said was going to happen and they're going to try to tie him the hook Let's see if that helps Hook. If it's a job stable you're feuding with, it's a job stable, and that's the way they've been treated. How many uh, How many more years he got on that 10-year contract, Jericho? Ooh. About eight? Maybe he'll hit, um, you know, he'll get a second wind at some point. He, he might need oxygen by then. But um, So then we got Dino Douche against Mac Daddy. Now, Mac Daddy, after he broke off from being just a, one of the Jericho appreciators, he's a, he's a part-time color commentator. He likes to run down and make saves in underneath and preliminary matches, and now he's wrestling the Lizard, 
and the lizard beat him fairly quickly and then got some more heat on him. And then here came Daniel Garcia making a save with the sloppiest, worst punches that I have seen in a wrestling ring in a long time. I don't know what the fuck. Again, anytime they put this guy in a position to impress me with anything, if he's so great and he can do all these have a coronas off the top rope and all of these Japanese crotch-locked leg strangles, why can't he throw a punch that doesn't look like a fucking awkward fucking 12-year-old girl with braces on her teeth? Explain that one to me, Lucy. Maybe he's never thrown a punch. Well, he needs to fucking practice then instead of doing all his goddamn 20-minute Japanese bullshit, figure out how to look like you're in a fight. Dumb shit. Give anyway. him advice. How should he practice it? What should he do? Good Lord. He's got a crazy schedule. Once a week, he has to go to a show. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Somebody needs to fucking show him. Then he needs to do it over and over until he can do it without potatoing anybody. Now that I've said that, who there is going to show him? And then it would require him to listen, but then I'm sure the other kids have said, oh, no, we trade chops now. So then Nick Plain jumped in and they stopped Garcia and they got some really slow lackluster heat and then walked off. But suddenly, from the entranceway, Edge appeared and threw the lizard off the stage and choked Nick Plain out and then began menacing Christian Cage. And suddenly Nick's mom came up behind Edge and tried to nutshot him, but he blocked it. Not really, if you go back and watch it in slow motion, because she didn't give him the Iggy right, but he got it. It was close enough. And then after blocking the nutshot, he chased Christian Cage out through the arena, through several areas of the backstage where cameras were strategically placed to catch the the chase scene, even though they weren't chasing the guys from behind, they were ahead of them. So they put them along their entire route out of the building. And then Christian carjacked some guy in an SUV and, and drove off and Edge turned to the camera and issued a challenge for March 20th Toronto TNT title I quit match. First of all, I thought this program was over. Wasn't this program over? It'll never be over. Didn't we want it to be over? We wanted it to be over. Or at least redone from the beginning. Well, it ain't over. But secondly, this one, Tony beat his record time from earlier. I swear to God, five seconds after Edge uttered those words, Sockface was saying, Tony Khan has made it official. <laughs> the the he didn't have time to press the button on the IFB and speak to a goddamn... It, it, it. <clears throat> anyway. Edge was also... Uh, it's important to note he was also uh, Sons of Anarchy Edge. Biker Edge. Well, they've, they, you know... Ready for he, a fight. A Toronto he, fight. He really... Yeah. He really also... He backslides on his personal grooming and his his attire when he comes out to the slum in the Indies like this. Okay, speaking of slumming in the Indies, did you see Rene Moxley good with Kyle O'Reilly? I did. I couldn't tell if his shirt was dirty from, like, sweat stains or if that was the design. And I spent the whole interview fascinated about that. No, it was sweat stains. And you were on to the most interesting thing about the interview. They brought him back. In the ridiculous way they brought him back at the pay-per-view where he just comes in looking like a, a hobo that's been sleeping under a bench and whispers to fucking Roddy and, and walks out, and now he's in a sweaty, dirty T-shirt and a baseball cap saying that he didn't think he'd ever wrestle again for a while and he's grateful to get a second chance and he's fallen down the mountain, but now he... He's got to do it on his own rather than be with his friends. I think that's what he's saying because he it, he didn't make any declarative statements. He beat around the bush and it looked like when he was saying he fa he's fallen down the mountain that he had some kind of personal problems, the way he's dressed and looking. So he said nothing and it, what he did say didn't make a lot of sense. And this is the way that they're 
re-debuting him from a, a legitimate potential career-ending injury, and he he does backstage pre-tapes and walks into the ring where he looks like a bum and says nothing. How is this interesting? How would this... You know, I don't think wrestling's ever gotten the bum thing right. There's never really been a good, uh, oh, he's a bum, but he could wrestle. And I always thought that was something that could have been done. Maybe this is the chance. He's from Washington or something, right? Well, uh, that's awful bad weather up there to be sleeping out in the street. a lot of bums. A lot of bums. Bums yeah. everywhere. So he could buy it. Maybe Darby found him on Gum Alley. <clears throat> brought him back. Well, speaking of bums, we were at the nine o'clock hour and out came the lollipop guild. Brian, the rock is going to be on the Oscars and the buckaroos weren't even runners up for the wrestling observer newsletter awards. Is that, is that an ironic uh, situation? I'm not sure if that's irony, but it's, it's something. Well, it's like rain on a wedding day. That's not irony either. Well, it was in the song. It's like having one hand in your pocket and the other one flashing a peace sign. That's a different song. Well, parts of that were a different song. Well, anyway, so at 9 o'clock, the, the new generic piano music plays. Now they're not doing the... They were doing... What was it? Thunderstruck? Whenever... Blah, 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 some kind of... They, it's just... Boring ass bullshit music. They raise the the Maddie and Nikki up through the stage in the middle of a fog bank while they're wearing their finest douchebaggery and blow off pyro after pyro. And the announcers are talking about, well, look at all the pyro they have. And what grandiose entrance, you know, the EVPs have given themselves, and nobody's given a shit. Are the people caring? Are those people standing there staring and mildly hooting this shit down, captivated with this new presentation of these two fucking uterine cleansing devices? No. I thought it was just me. So they kicked Tony Schiavone out of the ring. He ought to kick they ought to give Tony a fucking elevator over in one corner. Him having to climb in and out. And they they do a promo like two guys working at a Subway sandwich shop to, pretending to be wrestlers that on, on on their break. Like, oh, I, we, they, we saw this on TV. And the guy said, I'm going to tell you something. And uh, I don't know what... Hangnail Page, they announced that they hated to do it, but he attacked referees at the pay-per-view, so he's suspended indefinitely from the elite. Well, he's not... A, he's a heel now. He's supposed... So why are these heels suspending other another heel? And he's, they're not suspending him from A. They're suspending him from the elite? Just don't goddamn bring him up again, you fucking morons. You think people care about your little fucking boys clubhouse that fucking much? We don't care who's at your meeting when you have the treehouse thing all decked out. So they've suspended a, a, another heel from their little group. And then they say Twinkle Toes disappeared for no good reason. They're trying to get heat off of not being sympathetic to Kenny's problem with his lack of guts so they fired him from the elite I guess because he's a full-fledged baby face they can go ahead and fire him and then <laughs> it and and they're doing all this with that fakeness that you just can't unsee or unhear that you know that they're acting this way on purpose and they're putting us on and they're they've got their tongue in their cheek about it and then here comes Eddie Kingston's music. And he comes out to the ring and throws about $80 in fucking tens. I don't know what that was. Adam to pay his fine in advance and then attacks them in, I can't even call it sloppy. He, what was that? He, nothing was connecting. Were they ducking and flinching? Was he just throwing sloppy? pause in the air what was going on with that fight quote unquote i don't know i'll say it again i said it i think last week 
first time I saw him, I said, this guy throws the greatest punch I've seen in a while. Haven't seen him throw it in a while. I don't know what was going on there. Maybe he was afraid that they he would potato him and they really would find him. But anyway, they get him down. And they've got him trapped for their little double knee lift thing. And again, the people are standing there staring. Some of them, again, are who do I Will you just quit? There's no goddamn chaos going on. But then music plays before they can do their knee lift. And when Okada's name flashes up on the big screen, they pop. There's a big, because here's the goddamn dream guy that they wanted to sign that everybody thinks is so great, right? And they're okay. And he comes out dressed, I believe you said this to me, I think, off the air, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but he was dressed as the Japanese Cody Rhodes. What the, and out he comes, and he uh, he gets next to Kingston, and they face off with the buckaroos, and then suddenly <laughs> Okada gets behind Kingston like he's trying to give him the Heimlich maneuver, and fumbles to grab his arm and then spins him around. And I get there's his short arm clothesline. It's the Rainmaker or it's the whatever the fuck, right? So not only did he turn on Kingston, but he telegraphed it. Instead of just turning around and clotheslining the fucker, or kicking him or hit, doing anything, he, go, he takes five seconds to get to grip on him before he actually levels him. And then it's one short arm clothesline. And in this company where they don't sell goddamn being run over by a propane truck, Kingston takes one short arm clothesline, sells it like death, and he's down until the heels celebrate, walk around, and walk out, and he's still selling from one clothesline. They have they've turned their their big new investment heel just to give the buckaroos an artificial bump in their, in their segments in the ratings or in some type of interest level where if they're standing next to the guy that the people want to react to, they think that, that th they'll think that they're reacting to them. What, wh why are they doing this? The, the fucking big multi-million dollar signing they just did, Will Ostrich, they fucking put him in the heel group then he goes away for two months. They realize they need a fucking baby face and they bring him back and he's a baby face shaking hands with everybody while still in the heel group with the heel manager. And then they spend millions on this guy. And I get, he probably wouldn't have been as popular as ostrich because I am pretty sure he can't speak any English, right? Or very little. So he ain't going to be cutting any promos to anybody on his side. But they, they, he's a fucking heel now, too, to prop the buckaroos up. If you're going to make him a heel, at least make him a heel aligned with people that will draw money and interest instead of draw that away. Am I being overly critical here, or was this some dumb fucking shit that went on? In their minds, it's good shit. In their minds, it also sets up the potential elite versus elite feud down the road when Omega can do anything again, and Adam Page could be his buddy again, and they could feud with the new elite, maybe get a little trainee, a young boy, maybe Kota Ibushi will be able to walk by that point. Oh, forgot well, about him. There. I yeah, forgot about him until this very moment. No. <laughs> he's, he's in Tony Khan's new branch of his wrestling company called the Wrestler's Convalescent Home. Tony's going to sign people up to guaranteed contracts so they can go have fucking surgery and be out for two years on his dime. Okada is the biggest star in New Japan for maybe the last decade. So it's a big deal getting him. And to the fans who like that, he's a name that if you've caught up with New Japan at all in the last 10 years, he's been in the center of everything. You're putting him with the Bucks who are dead on arrival right now. Like you said, they're propping him up. AEW never does a good job capitalizing on the best way to use someone when they come in. With the exception, Malachi Black. When he first came in, they got more interest on him than he's had since, but a lot of that also was because of the dynamic with the fans reacting to Cody Rhodes. 
Well, and also a lot of it was we hadn't seen much of him yet. The more we saw, the less we liked. But everyone who comes in, they get squandered into something right away. Brian Danielson, Adam yeah. Cole, yeah, uh, right into their Orange Cassidy feud. Will Ospreay, you know, if you like the matches, and I really like uh, a couple of the matches, we'll talk about it later, they're great matches, but are they really elevating him? We'll talk about the numbers a little bit later. And now Okada. It seems like they never really, truly, properly capitalize on what someone could bring. Jay White. Jay White was a New Japan main eventer against guys like Okada. <laughs> and now he's in the Bang Bang Scissor Gang, having <laughs> scissor fights with his scissor friends. That's what AEW does to people. You get caught in scissor fights with scissor friends. <laughs> So you're not being overly critical. We'll see how it works. Um, you know, I'm not to, to play too much of a spoiler, but other than the first hour, it was the high point of the rating. So there was interest in seeing what this was going to be. If they can continue, that will be something. Now, I was unaware of this. I was watching Sven Gulli last night, but I had collision on one of the other monitors and I happened to look up. The Bucks and Okada had their first match as a six man. On collision. <laughs> the fuck? The big guy they bring in, they bury him on the show. Then, well, I said no one watches it. It's catching up the dynamite. I don't know. We'll see. But I didn't realize he was going to be wrestling on this show. Well, no, you misspoke. Dynamite's catching up to collision. Not the other way around. But no, it's so three days after he pops up and makes his surprise debut and joins with these fucking morons without advertising it in any way in advance except uh, uh, probably on Twitter they have a six man tag team match on television now in the midst of all this stuff with Okada wrestling for AEW Jim I don't know how much of this you saw and I don't have anything in front of me I could see what we could find but word went around that the press in Tokyo I forget the specific oh, okay. newspaper <laughs> was reporting that Okada signed a deal worth uh, I think four and a half million dollars a year with AEW. Yes, it, it was said to be 13 and a, 13 or 13 and a half million dollars over three years, which would translate to four and a half million dollars a year. I saw this <laughs> and then I saw people immediately trying to uh, sources say that's exaggerated and walking it back because let's face it for the for the newspapers, the sports press in Japan to be reporting that it's kind of like when Pro Wrestling Illustrated reported that there was a hundred thousand dollar bounty on Dusty Rhodes's head, right? You can't take that seriously because instantly everybody was like, <laughs> laughing, like, well, no wonder the WWE wasn't in any way competitive with that. That's you know, but, but that's a good thing. But that's a good thing for AEW for wrestlers to think that Tony's really throwing just stupid money around. No, no, it's not. Because he is. He really is throwing stupid money around. They'll do it. He, they know that already, but it, can you imagine with about five or six of those fucking guys that think that their goddamn shit doesn't stink when the, if they would hear that this guy's coming in and can't even fucking do promos, is going to be making two or three times as much money as that, whatever. No. It wouldn't do very good for locker room morale if this fucking guy got 13 million dollars in three years now see i don't think it's that yeah i don't think it's as outrageous as other people do just because of tony khan he's coming in there you know he's making it a minimum a million dollars oh well not, I, yeah i'm i'm agreeing with it probably maybe a couple of million because tony's a complete idiot so that's the baseline plus Tony probably gave maybe but a, a couple of these other morons are making a couple million dollars too. Moxley, I'm sure, is making a couple million dollars to go out there and take at a least, shit in the ring. At least. So, but if can you imagine if, if can you imagine the plumber's head exploding if he heard that Okada and believed that Okada was making twice as much as he was per year or whatever? Point being, we know that Tony is ridiculously throwing money at these people, and that's another reason why that I didn't. Uh, you seem to think that the WWE was more interested in both Ostrich and Okada than I did because I didn't think they would be that serious about it because I knew that it's Tony Khan's wet dream to be able to give his ever-dwindling pool of fans more shit to jerk off about. 
and that would be this. And he was going to pay them much more than the WWE ever would as a legitimate business investment in two talents. See, I agree with that part, but I did think WWE had an interest in him, a heavy interest. I don't think they were going to pay this kind of money. And they'll pay that kind of money to get you to return to the company if you've proven yourself. They're not throwing that kind of money at someone who's an unproven entity who, yeah. you know, I hate to say it because I think both guys are really good. And I think both guys are main eventers, but may or may not be sent to NXT for a brief period of time if they sign. So it's a completely different world. Will Ospreay has spoken glowingly about Tony Khan because you could tell it's changed his life. It's changed his lifestyle. It's changed everything. And that's well, what, yeah, that's the I Tony mean, Khan advantage now. When one of these guys comes up for free agency before WWE locks him down for a five-year deal, Tony could say, I'll pay you double what they'll pay you. I'll guarantee it. And you'll barely work. And if you feel like, you know, you have a headache, you could stay home. <laughs> And I'll fly you wherever you want to go, and it'll be first class. And if you want to go to any football games, I'll hook you up. You got to talk to me every now and then. I'm all right. I'm a little wired. But I mean well. And instead of going to Japan and spending two weeks there, a month there, whatever, and getting beat up, it's a whole lot easier to fly from the United States to or England or vice versa. And, you know, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. The problem is, he every time he buys a brand new gadget that works wonders at its its you know chosen application, he doesn't know how to use the thing and he can't read the directions, and it ends up being just another gadget in a drawer somewhere that nobody uses anymore. Here's another interesting thing to think about, considering Barry Bloom is the agent for a lot of these guys like Jericho, the Bucks, Omega, I think, Jim Ross. Do any of these guys have a most favored nations clause? Because that was one of his big things. And I'm, you know, all for that. You know, especially if it's on my behalf. Yeah. I'm all for an MFN. But do any of these guys have that? Because, I mean, at some point soon, Jericho may start <laughs> getting nosy, yeah. but we're not oh, there Jericho. yet. Well, there you go. Because <laughs> he's the most experienced. And and uh, that's the that's how... And Nash and Hall not only got a couple of raises with a favored nations clause in their contract in WCW in the day, but they also had to be asked to waive that when they brought Bret Hart in, right? In order to do the Bret Hart deal, because that's right. I think he was Bischoff wasn't going to raise them to what Bret Hart was making plus $1 or whatever. So they had to waive their right for that. And that can be read. Oh, that's the next thing Tony will get into. And it'll cost him a fucking fortune. Once these guys figure that out. Oh boy. Well, you know, Brian, if only there was some way that Tony Khan could save some money because it, all well, it is, it's, it's well, it, no, it's spin, spin, spin. That's all. It's all going out. It's not coming in. It's he, he's 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 pooping more than he's eating. That's not healthy, because sooner or later you'll run out of poop. I'll tell you what, what folks. If you want to keep you talking the, about that's you know think about it. If you poop more than you eat, sooner or later it's bad news. Well, you're expunging more than you're intaking. Isn't that impossible then? Well, that's another reason why it would be bad, <laughs> well, folks. I'll tell you thing. what. <laughs> See, there's all kinds of you're proving my point. <laughs> But if there was some way that Tony could save some money, I got an idea. A man like him, successful businessman, he's always making deals. He's always talking to the announcers about making matches. He's always on the phone. I bet you that Tony Khan, thanks to those people at Big Wireless, while well, he's paying a fortune for his phone plan, his cell phone plan, his talk plan, his text plan, his data plan, Hey. All the plans he's got. Hey, beyond that, all of his employees, all the employees of the Jaguars, the team probably picks up the bill for their corporate cell phone. There you go. That's a lot of money. That's a ton of money. Can you imagine? Because a lot of these bills, they're a hundred, hundred dollars a month or more. Well, imagine that times ten or twenty or fifty or a hundred. Why well, you see, Tony could literally make a profit on AEW right now by having all of his employees and related uh Hoy Poloy's switching over 
to Mint Mobile because Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for 15 bucks a month. And it's not just where you can talk on the phone, oh no, contraire. You can actually text with this thing. You know, like the kids do with their thumbs. They, they type onto the phone, and at the other end of it, people get a written message. You can be a part of that now, ladies and gentlemen, with Mint Mobile. And there's something called high-speed data. I'm not sure what the data is on, whether it's a dossier on individuals stolen from the FBI or whether they're just telling you what the weather report is, but if you want data, they'll give it to you quick, high speed. And it's the nation's largest 5G network. What is that, Brian? What does the G's, is that a 5 gig network? Is this where That's, the gigs come in? That is where a gig comes in. That and well, John Moxley's forehead. Well, see, they've got five of them. Moxley has more than that. Folks, with Mint Mobile, you can choose from a three-month plan, a six-month plan, or a 12-month plan and say goodbye to your monthly phone bill and say hello to, I guess, a phone bill that comes every three, six, or 12 months. But you say goodbye, I say hello. Because at Mint Mobile, they give you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. Remember, the family uh, plan starts at two lines. So you, I guess that could be for your significant other. Maybe you're a single parent. And your family only consists of two people. You get a phone for both of you. Hey, you but know we're what? not limited at two. You can get, like, if you have the Brady Bunch, you can get 18 phones. For the listeners having affairs, this is a wonderful way to get your mistress a custom number, a custom phone, a new phone, a phone line, something you'll pay for, something I'm trying to say. There you go, a Mint Mobile mistress. There you Folks, go. If, if you sign up right now for $15 <laughs> a month, you get premium wireless and... A regular blowjob on the side. Well, no, you can't guarantee that. Now you're going too far. We could joke well, about you, it, but you can't you might guarantee have to, that. You might have to take Mint Mobile to dinner first. And you can use your own phone number with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep that same phone number and the same phone. Every, you actually get nothing. They just tell you, go ahead and do everything you've been doing. We'll take care of everything else. But it's a great deal. Well, of course it is, because it's just 15 bucks a month. Your first three months of premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month, are available now, and you can get the plan shipped to your door for free. They'll write out the whole plan, send it to you, and you can read it and take it from there. Mintmobile.com slash JCE. If you sign up for your first three months, it's going to be $15 a month. Mintmobile.com slash JCE. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply, but... Some of the rules don't apply to you. See Mint Mobile for details. That's right. See Mint Mobile for details. They support us. You should support them. One more time, what's that promo code? Jim? Well, we're, we're supporting uh, all of each other. MintMobile.com slash JCE for the uh, incredible financial deal that was, can save Tony Khan from bankruptcy and ruin. You'd hate to see a man like that out on the street selling pencils on the corner. Imagine the hero he would be to his father if he came into the office one day, into the boardroom, and said, Dad, it's so nice to see you here on shore once again. I have in my hand documentation I could save us millions of dollars with Mint Mobile. But then he'd say to him, he'd say, But son, you said you were going to run this big wrestling company, and... All you're doing is spending your inheritance. Why should I believe you now? Dad, I'm doing my best. And then Shad points out the next match on Dynamite was Chris Statlander versus Riho. You know what? They always treat it like a surprise when she returns. It's always a surprise. I always pop like, oh my God, she's still there. Riho, an AEW <laughs> original. Well, they treat it like it's always a surprise. Rather, they keep it secret until the last minute so that the people won't run off is another way of looking at it. You know, I want to give her a chance, and I want to... No. I want to. I try. I really do want to, because I, uh, unlike you, I'm a good-hearted person. I want to. And as soon as she comes out there and she does the smile and the wave like she's a little girl, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> I can't take this seriously, let alone the fact that she's half the size of her opponents and... They sell for everything and take fucking German suplexes and everything for her. <laughs> but I want to, but she's ridiculous. She is your kid doing the moves they see on wrestling to you and you going along with it. Yes. So it gets a reaction because the kid is doing a good job of mimicking the wrestlers. 
But on its face, it's ridiculous. And I'm not saying all small wrestlers are ridiculous, but Rio is. Well, no, at some point, uh, when you're this small, it's ridiculous, especially with Chris Statlander. Why book that? Why embarrass and minimalize and bury one of the only girls you got on your roster that actually looks like she could be a star if, if there was some fucking quality training available? I suggest, Chris, follow Jane Cargill. Map out her route. Call Stamford. Whatever the fuck. Are you and Miss Cargill friends? Now is the time to exploit that friendship. I was so embarrassed. And because not only, ladies and gentlemen, who didn't watch this program, and I know there's a bunch of you out there, Riho gave up a foot in height, 75 pounds in weight, and I don't know what the the uh, the phrase is for how you measure talent, but she gave up a lot of that too to Statlander, and Statlander had to figure out how not to accidentally break her in fucking half for 10 minutes, and then Riho rolled her up one, two, three. So, I mean, it... it, it it's it, it's not about, well, we blamed Kenny, Twinkle Toes, Kenny Olivier for so long because of his weird fixation on this Japanese underground wrestling business that he was involved in where they wrestle these small nine-year-old girls and people dressed as giant pandas and whatever the fuck's going on over there in that crowd. But he's he's home. He's in a hospital. He's he's out. It, it can't even be explained at this point. You could have blackmail material on a motherfucker, and they wouldn't be pushing for you to get pushed like this. This is some, again, some warped thought of Tony Khan that this girl should actually be a professional wrestler and deserves to be on national television. And until he comes to a moment of clarity, apparently everybody's going to have to put up with this and talent at some points is going to have to fucking stooge for this business. And it's, it's embarrassing. I remind you in the past, Tony Khan has stated that Riho was a ratings mover, a ratings draw. And that was one of the justifications for her being used. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, I'm sure. And, and maybe we'll just see if that's born fruit or if he's gone fruit loopy. Uh, but anyway, so then we moved on to the next time that Tony Schiavone was going to be in the ring to try to interview somebody. This time he got through most of it. It was with Darby Allen, who <sighs> Tony, uh, uh, you know, he's pro and next promo and next week. It's going to be Darby against light switch Jay White. But then the question is, what's it going to be like in your career without staying? And everybody knows I made it plain last week after I saw what they did. I'm done with Darby Allen. He's beyond help. There's talent there. There's charisma there. There's opportunity there. And he's determined to waste all of it by being a stupid idiot. And he said, well, I said that I'd stop, and I talked about this at the top of the program. I said I'd stop at nothing to make sure Sting's retirement got the respect it deserved. Respect was an actual quote. That's why he stole all the attention, as I said at the top of the show. We talked about that business. And then he said he's going to wrestle next week against Jay White, and then he's going to leave March 27th to go climb Mount Everest. And there's no guarantee, folks, that I'll come back alive. And, you know, again, if, if somebody was working and, you know, trying to build up danger and intrigue and mystery and interest in something that we were going to be able to pay to fucking see or be involved in or somehow is going to magnify the value of the company that he's working for i can see it but there really is no guarantee that this idiot's going to come back alive from being an amateur trying to climb mount everest so therefore tony khan is letting him come out here not only try to commit suicide on his pay-per-view but then he said there's no guarantee i'm going to come back alive but if next week is my last match i'm going to go out fighting and he's telling the truth and i bet you tony would pay the balance of Darby Allen's contract to his 
next of kin if he didn't make it off Mount Everest because Tony is a sap like that. So Darby does the promo, and I was right as I was about to say, can somebody please put him on some kind of involuntary hold for a few days? Jay White came out with the guns, and it got worse because Jay White speaking is deaf, and they let him, and it goes on forever. And I don't know whoever told him it was interesting or to the point or delivered with conviction, but it's just blithering around the bush. They had that guy beat the AEW champion when MJF held the belt. Well, if you went, that's another reason why Tony's fucking statistics don't work with the numbers and everything. Because if you go back and look at the way he treated some people last year that he's trying to get us to buy his main eventers this year, you'd come up with different ideas. So Jay White gave Darby the chance to back out of the match and join the bang, bang, scissor gang bangers as Darby scissor hands and nobody cared in the audience. And Darby responded and nobody cared in the audience because they had already been bored to fucking tears. And as we know, there were only 3,200 ticket holders and we don't know that all of them came. So as they were, as they lost people to disinterest and attrition, it was getting quieter. How many times have we seen this too in AEW in five years? No, 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 I don't have a problem with you. I want you to join my faction. <laughs> Why? We've already got to rent two cars, but we want another. So then the way that this confrontation came to an end was Darby whispered something to Jay White and stuck the bat into Jay White's neck and Jay White acted like that there was glue on the end of the bat and he couldn't just back up one half a step and pull his fucking chin off the bat <laughs> <laughs> and Darby said he, did you see that? I didn't think of it that way I, mean, I saw it the, the fucking bat the way you lay it out is... he stuck the bat in his neck and suddenly <laughs> Jay White couldn't just go poop and just take it off his neck or his friends right next to him and his, and his two friends were right next to him, uh, to him allowing him to be uh, stuck to a bat and Darby said I'll see you next week <laughs> and that was all that happened they have to do that now a bat covered in glue match <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to hit you with the bat we're going to stick it to you <laughs> oh golly <laughs> I don't know. All all these all these people got me running around like Vic Morrow. I don't know. Oh come on! But That's anyway, not even funny. So, That's awful. Awful. Uh, I wonder who came up with it. But anyway, so then the House of Black did a dark room promo with the spooky lighting, and it looked for there was Malachi and. Julia Hart was over on the side looking as only she can look. And what are his other two names? Fabin and Snabin. I forgot what. Uh, Brody King. Brody and, and Buddy. And Buddy Murphy. Yeah. Well, it looked like a reshoot of the Bohemian Rhapsody video. Somebody said on Twitter. <laughs> mama mia, mama mia, mama mia, <laughs> let me go. Beelzebub. <laughs> and they're, they're doing a promo about poor Mark Briscoe that hasn't suffered enough by this point and a match that they were going to have on Collision on Saturday night, and then they came out in in the back at, with Mark Briscoe, and it's an Atlanta street fight because they're in Atlanta again, or did they already tape it? Were they taping it that night? I think they taped everything Wednesday and Thursday. Good Lord. So there'll be even fewer people in the audience by the time they, the Atlanta street fight, because they're in Atlanta, and Jay Lethal comes in, bless him, and said that he would have Mark Briscoe's back and he's going to bring Jeff Jarrett. And, and that's what Mark's like, I don't want no Jeff Jarrett around. Hey, who would you rather have than another slimy, slime ball, slimy fellow with slime? So Mark is marginalized and on the B team. And then we were ready for our main event. And it was Will Ostrich versus Kyle Felcher. And... We talked about, again, 
okay, if they understood that they made a mistake by making Ostrich a heel, putting him in the Fallis family, when the people want to cheer him and they desperately need baby faces because the only baby faces they got are their heels. So they want to back up on that now that he's finished with New Japan a couple months later. They had the match with our boy Take so that there could something happen and they could turn on fell on uh, ostrich and you know that he'd be a baby face and he might have a program that he could start to get over with or whatever but they just have a match between the two of them at the pay-per-view and then shake hands and hug and then don Fallis announces another match between ostrich and another member of his stable and that is this with mr felcher and there is still Fletcher. no reason, that's what I said, no reason given for having this match or why he, he as a as a evil manager, wants his guys to fight each other. Otherwise, they have a great match, which makes no sense. So they have this as the main event, but they've just signed Ostrich for what I assume is millions of dollars. Again, like... It, we're disputing Okada's four and a half million a year thing, and certainly it can't be more than two or two and a half. Tokyo Sports is reporting $3 billion. For Ostrich. Of course. Okay, a billion a year. But the uh, point is, it's a lot of money. So you want to introduce this guy in as strong and dominant a manner as possible. So first, he go if you're... Your take was still where they needed to be pushing him. So they couldn't just beat him like a fucking flunky because he will be something somewhere sometime, probably not here. And, but at the same time, it took Will 20 minutes to beat him. So who are we pushing? And now they do the same thing. It's not about what moves the guy can do or how well he can do them or even how great a match he can have if you let him have How great a match can a great match have or have if a great match ever can be let have a great match? Not applicable. You're pushing the star you just signed. You don't have him go out and do everything that he can do to beat a guy that's been presented as mid-card at best in 20 minutes, and especially when the guy that's been presented as mid-card at best doesn't look like Braun Breaker. He looks like Ball Breaker. 12 years old in the fucking face with that fucking fleshy physique at best. He's got size, but he needs in the gym and ages on his face to make him look like anybody that you would want to have going 20 minutes competitively with a guy you're paying a couple million dollars a year to have I made this point it's not what moves a guy can do it's whether he should given the position of his presentation and with ostrich's first the pay-per-view was his first match since he's been back I know he's wrestled a couple times on television but on this run it's his first TV match. He's starting a full-time contract here. And you can't give him someone with some element of personality. If you want the people to cheer Will, then give him a heel with personality and an experience that he can beat in a decisive fashion, showing all of his shit and looking good, but not having that much trouble. Or if you want him to be a fucking heel... Give him a baby face that fits the same description that also that the people know that's been presented as some level of star in the past or some level of talent in the past. It, it This was good athletic shit. It was all modern style wrestling with lots of the video game stuff. But that's not the point. A again, with... <laughs> with nobody to cheer for and nobody to cheer against and no reason to have the match and nothing on the line, and a brand new main eventer that needs convincing wins so that the majority of the audience that doesn't know who the fuck he is might find out. Because he's been on New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access. He's been a star on the internet, but he ain't been on American television. The telly. You do that. You and the announcers at that point are telling you why this guy is a 
a top guy and what his background is, and then he's showing you, and then he does promos and hopefully tells you how great he is. And then you involve him in a competitive situation. That's how you start out a long-term push and investment in the money that you're spending long-term. You don't give the people his goddamn... He doesn't meet his equal in the ring in week three of a three-year deal. You fucking morons. And, but anyway, also... um. And and let's face it, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Felcher is never going to be a top guy. It, well, he will be probably after I'm dead, because it'll take him 10 years in the gym to work out some kind of fucking look and age that face to the point where anybody would take him seriously. But also, when they got in the middle of the ring and started trading chops, I zoned out, and they went to break at two minutes until the top of the 10 o'clock hour, and my DVR never came back. But I assume from what I read on the internet, that Will won and nobody fucking broke up with anybody again. Is that about what happened? That's about what happened. I will say I really liked it. I thought it was better than the Takeshita match. I agree with you there. And of course, the Takeshita match got like six and <laughs> a half million stars. Six and seven eighths. It was Dave's hat size since he's a pinhead. I thought this was good, but to your point, if you sign someone for main event money with the intention of treating them as a main eventer, you have to start somewhere. And they're not doing it. And we'll talk about the ratings shortly. They're not doing it. And Osprey is someone they should present that way. He's really good. And he's talented, and people will like him. And he's a talented heel, too. But this is not... Whoever suggested this is the way to just break him away from the Callus family or make him a babyface, or maybe it'll be like a Prince Nana thing, where Callus manages him as a babyface and the rest of the stable is heels. <laughs> you never know with AEW; it's nutty over there. But I really liked it at the end of the I th match, and I, I will agree with you. It was better than the 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 take match because, again, it seemed like parts of that thing they were just so so drawn out because they were trying to have some kind of classic this they had to move a little more quickly but these guys are very athletic and if they got into a training program that would teach them how to think about the business instead of being indie-minded marks i believe that they could probably do well but who knows if they're trainable or not but otherwise it's the same shit that everybody else is doing just like i said about ostrich and and take the same stuff everybody else is doing, just more athletic and a little bit better at it. At the end of the match, the two opponents embraced <laughs> because I think they said that uh, one of them used to live with the other one when he was struggling. Oh. Uh, so they have a friendship. Well, and, there, and there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than a breakup, and there's nothing more heartwarming than than two people getting back together after a, a bitter breakup. Well, nothing can change the bond between roommates. I mean, they must have had a good time together. Oh, you mean it was platonic? It was completely platonic. What the hell were you saying? They used to live together. I Not like were, that, you dirty I they pervert. Were Get out of here. I didn't, didn't know whether they wanted to try it out before they committed to marriage. That's to see not if what was I was gonna... saying. Well, listen, they embraced. They're cool. But then Brian Danielson came out. And that's uh -oh. where we're going next. Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. Danielson's mad because his wife told him that hair looks good when he left the house. No, I don't know why uh, Danielson uh, has a problem with anyone. I don't know why he's been booked as poorly as he has. Even for those of you who love his matches. But uh, that's what we have to do. Well, now, next. what did he do when he came out? He came out and he stared. He made them know that he's paying attention. He sees uh -oh. them. Uh oh. Now, you can't say he acknowledges them because that would be a trademark infringement, but he notices them. And, and obviously, with the way he was staring, he intended it to, to intimidate them. Yes, all five Good. foot six okay. of them. Yes. Well, there was an action-packed ending to that uh, that particular program, and I must again. I don't know the ebbs and the flows, the ups and the downs, but I know enough. And you're going to tell us the rest, but I know enough to admit a correction here on the program. I've been wrong, and I, whenever I'm proven wrong, I acknowledge that. I think I've set that track record. And I have been proven wrong again. I'm going to acknowledge it. I made the statement 
that there were 800,000 people in this country that were going to watch that television program no matter how bad it sucked. And I was wrong. And I apologize. Brian, what were the ratings for this episode of AEW Dynamite from, uh, I believe, March the 6th? March the 6th on TBS AEW Dynamite, 8 to 10 p.m. Although it went to 10.07. Hold on, let me just make sure this is the most updated version here. Yeah, 8 to 10 p.m. This is from WrestleNomics. 779,000 viewers on average. Ouch! That, so That is the, down 5% the, from last week. The pay-per-view after the pay-per-view, the television after the pay-per-view, for the people who didn't get it, what's going to be said, What's uh, the tie, tag titles changed hands, Sting retired. This guy did that. No, Not only no interest bump, but an interest dip after the pay-per-view. And again, they have a big episode coming up this next week from Boston, Big Business, the debut of Mercedes Monet. And with AEW, a lot of the issue isn't just getting a number for someone's debut, it's finding a way to maintain any of it. But let's go to this. Once again, these were compiled by Russell Nomics. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m. The Swerve Strickland, Samoa Joe, Adam Cole live promo. 930,000 viewers. Oh boy. So the something's going the bottom is going to fall out of the market very soon, folks. Strap in. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Again, a minute at least of the Big Bang Theory to start that off. Quarter 2, 8:15 8:30 p.m. Samoa Joe and Swerve Strickland versus Matt Taven and Mike Bennett with picture in picture ads. The Chris Jericho hook backstage angle an ad break, a recap, and the Young Bucks backstage promo, 785,000 viewers. Okay, and, and see, that's why, because when you start with a number like that and considering the overall average, it had to plummet, and boy, how he did it with 145,000 people in 15 minutes. That, uh, he, where are we going from here? Again, no star power. Jericho star power is gone. They've zapped that, thanks to him. But let's go from there. 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. Quarter three. Hook versus Brian Cage with picture-in-picture -picture ads. A post-match with the Mogul Embassy and Jericho. A recap. The Orange Cassidy Best Friends backstage promo. 792,000 viewers. <laughs> fluctuation amongst people getting up to go to the bathroom or coming back from getting a sandwich. So we got 7,000 back. Quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. Matt Menard versus Killswitch. The post-match with Nick Wayne, Christian Cage, Adam Copeland, Nick Wayne's mom, on the ramp. <sighs> the Kyle O'Reilly backstage promo, an ad break, and a Sting video. 779,000 viewers. So we've, we've already... The quarter that featured Edge, one of the major WWE stars of the modern era, lost 13,000 viewers from the pissy quarter hour that featured a bunch of these generic jobber indie guys well to be fair the fans didn't know that edge was going to be there he was a surprise uh, it was a surprise to christian well, and stable true. yeah yeah it's true they thought they they thought they were just seeing the dinosaur and fucking dipshit but there were other surprises the big nine o'clock hour nine to nine fifteen p.m quarter five the young bucks live promo their confrontation with eddie kingston the debut of okada and the start of Riho versus Statlander, 865,000 viewers. Also, the high point in the key demo, 411,000. So taking everything into account, and they haven't lately been doing a bump at the top of the 9 o'clock hour, but in this case, they added uh, um, 86,000 people is that they they knew the announcement was going to be Okada because we knew Okada was signing, or is was that the fault? In other words, did because they brought Okada out as a surprise, but then they kept going in that quarter. I'm wondering if it can 
if the people suddenly called around to their friends, oh, God is out there. I think a lot of a lot of it, too, is I tried this show for a few minutes. I'll come back after the show I went to instead ends. It ends at nine o'clock. You go see what's going on on the other channel. More of the normal audience may have just said, well, it's it's, you know, we'll check back in. Well, but never, but nevertheless, that's, you know, it's pretty obvious they wanted to see what was going to go on with Okada, if that is indeed the pro the situation. We go from there to quarter six, 9.15 and 9.30 p.m. The continuation of Riho versus Statlander with picture in picture. The Tony Storm Mariah May backstage promo. An ad break. And Willow Nightingale's backstage promo. 726,000 viewers. Oh, geez. And then 139,000 people said, fuck, we missed Okada. Oh, God almighty. They lost everybody that they got plus another fucking 50-something thousand. They came back at the 9 o'clock hour to see what was there to hold them, and it didn't come. It didn't happen. We go from there to quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The Darby Allen promo in confrontation with Jay White. The Julia Hart backstage promo. The wind is blowing in the background. I don't know if anyone could hear that. Oh, boy. The House of ba House of Back. The House of Blacks backstage promo. Oh, mamma mia, mamma mia. <laughs> there was an ad break and also the Mark Briscoe, Jay Lethal backstage angle. 747,000 viewers. Good Lord, they actually aimed, a, aimed, they actually added people for backstage uh, malarkey. And finally, Jim, quarter eight, I remind you, we have a seven minute overrun. Quarter eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. Will Ospreay versus Kyle Fletcher with picture in picture twice. 654,000 viewers. Oh! Seven minute overrun, including post match confrontation with Brian Danielson, six hundred and seventy six thousand viewers. Final quarter did three oh six in the key demo. They drove away those fans too. Oh boy, because it was a a match for no reason with nobody. If you didn't want to see guys do moves, then they gave you no other reason to watch it. And they think they're delivering good stories. That's the sickness. The sickness. That's the problem. They think they're delivering good stories. The people who defend them will say, how could you say they have no stories? The stories are great. The stories suck and no one gives a shit. And people tune out. This kid that dresses up like a guy in this video game is going to fight that kid dressed up like the guy in that video game. And boy, you ought to see the way that they catch each other's foot and boost each other up in the air so they can land on their feet. What the? Let's do our exercise. Hey, one other thing on this before we uh, wrap things up, because several listeners sent this in, so let's just address this quickly. Okay. Will Osprey tweeted out March 8th. When is the 8th? That was Friday. And thus, my first tour under the AEW banner has come to an end. <laughs> Thank you so much for such an overwhelming response to everyone backstage. Thank you so much for allowing me into the home you've built. What the... I will cherish this place and treat it as my own. I'm banged up bad, but my foot is still on the gas pedal. But now I'm going to get on this flight home to my beautiful missus and stepson and enjoy the fruits of my labor. I believe in AEW. Oh my God. Uh, by He's... the way, for the record, after this caused a bit of an outcry, he had to tweet out later on, also, guys, I'll be back Tuesday for work. Don't worry. Because people were afraid what? that he wasn't coming back anytime That's soon. the thing, is it? What if he was here from fucking Saturday till goddamn Wednesday? Uh, now my tour, it, my first tour is over. It was a cold winter. I feared at one point the Tories may have been able to emerge triumphant, but fortunately, as we dug into the trenches, the cannons arrived from General Farquhar. My first tour, also known as Two Days in Duluth. It's, I'm serious. It's, he, he was at the pay-per-view and the goddamn TV taping on Wednesday, right? And Thursday. They, oh, they did one Thursday. I think so, yeah. So they didn't tape all of the collision stuff with, in, 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 on the Wednesday night taping with 3,000 people there. They came back the next night with less people. Uh, let's see. They taped Dynamite. I don't have anything here for Collision. They taped Dynamite... 
and Rampage, but Collision was taped the next day. How many people did they have? Oh, we already said that. That was uh no, no. Uh, it was two nights. They had th- thirty-two hundred or whatever Wednesday night for Dynamite. What about for Collision on Thursday night? Well, Collision the next night, same uh, Gas South er- uh, area, Gas South Arena, Duluth, yeah, Georgia. It's a gassy area. There's a lot of Waffle Houses. We're the Gas South gang. You better watch out. Uh, at that point in time, I don't know if these are the final numbers, but tickets distributed were two thousand one hundred and sixty-six. Oh, good Lord. All right. And for the record, that building, the Gas South Arena, capacity is listed as 13,000, but I don't, know if that's for, I don't know if that's for basketball or not. So that changes things. Well, no, that uh, a capacity for an arena will always be listed as the amount of permanent seats. And the, if you put ringside or for concerts on the floor, that's, that's extra. Then there's a, a capacity for fire. You know that you can't have over such and such people in the building, but they generally list an arena capacity by the permanent seats for a show with nothing on the floor, but a court or whatever. But nevertheless, that's a fucking very small number of people for a very big building for two nights in a row. The 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 tickets distributed were five thousand over the two nights, and the capacity of the building twice is almost thirty thousand. So you can add up both nights; it still isn't even SmackDown. It's not even well, halfway. That, it's not there even you halfway go. There. Jeez. But nevertheless, let's do one thing. Let's do the our exercise and then move on from these ratings. Take the ratings and drop the first quarter and drop the overrun that are artificial numbers, and take the seven in between quarters and see what the fuck the average is now we're the only people that do this honest to god real uh factoring in of things divided by seven yeah carry the two seven hundred and sixty four thousand viewers seven hundred so they got an artificial bump of 15,000 on their total by having the overrun and the artificial first quarter with the Big Bang Minute. Well, there you go. Every little bit helps when the team is in need, Brian. Every little bit helps when the team is in need. But you know what? I'm thinking, just off the top of my head, Brian, last, that the AEW talent roster, before they're tough enough to whoop up on the the head of the table and the board of directors and the American nightmare and all those other big stars over on the other channel, they're going to have to eat a lot more of their meat and potatoes. As mama Cornette used to say, they're going to have to get out. They're going to have to clean their plates and they're going to have to work hard to get big and bad enough to fight the big boys. Aren't they? I mean, there's a chance Tony would pay for these meals. Yeah. Well, but you know, there's a chance that Tony will pay for anything. Until finally Tony's so broke, he won't be able to pay attention. But I'll tell you, folks, if you're getting tired of paying high prices for for rotten meals and you want to pay lower prices for those rotten meals, or if you're getting tired of just eating dreck and fast food garbage that's bad for you, that's going to give you some kind of horrible, cancerous growth on your body, or it's going to poison your innards and your insides or it's going to give you some kind of leprosy on your skin because all this modern food is just horrible for you or if your hurry scurry existence that you live in the hustle and bustle of your world is too busy for you to be able to go in that kitchen and concoct the oysters Rockefeller from scratch and make the sauces and the gravies and the various puddings of the world snappy pappy snappy pappies if you if you don't have time for all that you need to talk to our friends at factor because eating has never been easy and uh, easier and eating better has never been easier it's never been easy for me pimping was easy but eating better was not but factors delicious ready to eat meals they put everything in there i mean they put the main course they could put the sides The only thing they don't put in is the bill with the tip for the server because you're just popping this stuff in the oven or the microwave. Boom, it's ready to go in just two minutes. Like Lauren Boebert. 
You'll have over 35 <laughs> different options to choose from. Every week of the of the calendar year, including they got the Calorie Smart line, the Protein Plus line, the Keto line. Now, I'll tell you some of the fine dinners that we had over here at the castle. We had the roasted garlic chicken with green beans and sour cream and the onion mashed potatoes. We had the red pepper queso chicken with brown rice. And who can forget the ever popular Parmesan and sun-dried tomato chicken penny with the roasted green beans penne. and the pearl onions. Penne, not penny. Well, you say penne and I say penny and we, we ate it just the same. It's penne. You don't have to be able to pronounce it to eat it. And that's what you must do. You must eat these factor meals. Because, and they've got everything to take care of you all day. they got breakfast. they got smoothies. they got midday bites. And once again, a chef has approved this. And you know those cooks, boy, I'll tell you what, you slip them something under the table, they'll get into anything. But a chef has approved this, and a dietician, for, and whatever they do. They, apparently, the dietitians are the ones that craft the diet plans that you can't stick to. No, the but dietitians they work with are the ones who help craft the right meals with the right caloric intake and all that stuff. Well, that's exactly what the caloric intake is, what the dietitian is all about, and they'll control this stuff, and you'll be surprised what you'll find when you look at the various ingredients. You're not going to find things like sewer sludge and motor oil. You're going to find good quality, real food ingredients in these items. And again, they're ready to heat up. You could just run a candle under them, shine a flashlight on them. It'll get warm enough. Eat some things rare every once in a while. There's no mess. If you eat the whole thing, you got nothing left. Just throw the dish away. So no prepping, no cooking, no cleanup. Well, you can spend all your time getting a second or even a third job or discovering a cure for cancer. And they have figured out, Brian, mathematically, that factor meals are less expensive than takeout. And every meal, of course, dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So the dietitians also are the ones adjudicating the taste value of these meals. That's their job. And you folks can head to factormeals.com right now and use the code JCE50, and you're going to get 50% off whatever you order. And again, the meals for all throughout the day. If you're, if you're conscious in the morning, eat breakfast. If you're more alert in the evening, eat dinner. Heck. Go crazy and eat two meals in one day. You can handle the strain. But if they're all just wrapped up and boxed up and waiting for you, you don't have to lift a finger. Well, you do have to lift a finger because you got to pick up a fork. Unless you want to be a savage and eat with your hands, stick your face in the goddamn tray of factor meals and just graze like a fucking bovine. That'd be the best thing, but nevertheless. Wouldn't be the best thing. No, it would not. Well, but you're going to eat these things one way or the other. I'll they tell you are that. delicious, especially and with utensils like civilized people. Yes, and finish your plate because there, are, there is people coming by to inspect afterwards to make sure there's hungry people in Bolivia somewhere, so you can't be wasting food. But anyway, right now, factormeals.com slash JCE50. Use that code JCE50 and you get 50% off if you want to give one to your kids, let them fight over it. If you got more than one kid and you're giving them one meal, well, get them competitive early. But just share it with the whole family. Factormeals.com slash JCE50. 50% 50 off the choice or the, the cost of the food that you choose to feed yourself and your loved ones. That's right. Factor. Once again, well, you just gave the promo code what to do it, but it is delicious. I like the grilled chicken with... Sweet potato mash and corn, and it's just... I like the penny. And the penne. Jim's a fan of... Hey, Jim, real quick, uh, before we move on, here's the lineup for Collision that you didn't watch. Oh! The House of Black versus Jeff Jarrett, Mark Briscoe, and Jay Lethal in an Atlanta street fight. Oh, good Lord. Does it say what happened? Tell me that Jeff Jarrett didn't turn on Mark Briscoe. I don't have the results, only the lineup. Uh, well, we'll find. I'm sure it'll be all over the news. Uh, if I can did. pull up the results if you want on the second match that you didn't see, Jim. Mystico versus Angelico. Well, now, so Mystico wasn't involved in the uh, visa fiasco. 
either that or he's still in the country, or are they just using his mask and putting it on some guy like Nick Goulas used to do? You don't know? I was on mute. I know that I was on mute. No, AEW would never do that. That's a WWE thing. They would never hide uh, or pretend someone was the actual masked superstar. Or not the mass superstar, but a superstar that is the, masked. The superstar that would be masked. That's well, right. that's a, when, when Nick Goulas had the interns or the mighty Yankees or some mass team on top, and he would book them in like two or three different towns, and whoever the biggest advance was would get the real ones. All right, I have here uh, the rest of the matches, Jim. Yes. Brian Daniel. Actually, I have the results, it looks like. In the main event, the House of Black won the six-man tag street fight over Briscoe, Ethel, and Jarrett. Brian Danielson defeated Shane Taylor. Afterwards, he was confronted by Will Ospreay. And stared at. And that's right. Also, Angelico tapped out to Mystico. Chris Jericho defeated Titan. The Gates of Agony then attacked Chris Jericho after the match. But Hook made the save. Also, Mariah May pinned Trish Adora. Deanna Perrazzo attacked Tony Storm, but was DDT'd by May. FTR announced they will be in the tag title tournament. And also the elite of Okada and the Young Bucks defeated Liam Gray, Adrian Alanis, and John Cruz. Adrian Alanis? Adrian Alanis. So they just threw that out there. His first TV match, his first six-man tag with his partners in douchebaggery with no promotion, no advance notice against job guys. For what purpose? Tony well, can't, that, Tony that, can't uh, book. Tony can't book. But again, I mean, that kind of guy, and I've been saying it. Now, some people are out there. They're going to be saying, well, Cornette keeps saying, give them easy matches to show their shit. When you sign a multi-million dollar guy, also advertise it ahead of time. And don't put these fucking leeches in the match either. Let him show what he can do against some quality opponent in an advertised debut so the people might tune in. Hey, hey, hey. <sighs> Is that all you got there? That's all I got. Because I got something, and I bet you I bet you know what I got, but I bet the people don't know what I got, but I'm going to tell them what I got right now. 